and welcome to Seriously Pointless Conversations About Culture, your Seriously Pointless podcast about all your nerdy and geek things across time and the perfect society, which is Alpha Complex. <laughs> I'm your host, David, and I'm joined by the co-host, James. How you doing, man? I'm doing very well. Hello, friend James. <laughs> you look worried, citizen. Relax. That's welcome right. to Alpha Complex. The year is 214. Take <laughs> a take a relaxing pill. That's right. <laughs> You have six clones and a, laser, and a laser pistol. The computer is your friend. That's right. So if you guys haven't figured it out yet by our dumb nomenclature that we've been spewing out, uh, we are going to be talking about the world famous Paranoia RPG, which this is probably one of our one of our favorite RPGs that we played, other than Pathfinder and D anD. I would say this is easily top ten RPGs of all time. Oh, hundred percent. That's a so. controversial statement. Especially since it's, you wouldn't like play a campaign of paranoia. Oh God, no! But for one shots, it is amazing. I know. There's no. I don't think I could do a prolonged campaign. Maybe like one or two sessions, maybe. But like the one shots are just the antithesis. They're just so good, and they're so wacky and zany. We'll get into it a little bit yeah, later. I, I did find a campaign one time that I almost wanted to play. Yeah, but it was one of those really straight laced ones where. It'd be so oppressive that I don't think you could actually enjoy playing it. You can't. That's the thing is that you can go. You have to go hard one way or the other with it. And I'll, we'll get into it a little bit more. But it's, it's, it's either going to be incredibly just so like trying to tie yourself in, in knots to try to figure out how to how to get what you need to get done, or it's going to be just a straight Orwellian 1984 type thing. This one verged into the Orwellian. Uh, the the writer of it was inspired by Chairman Mao's Great Leap Forward. Oh God, <laughs> I've I've read bits and pieces of that dude, and that is that is a tough. Oh man, it had the same kind of vibe where like Woo! the players were put in charge of an algae factory, and they were supposed to use this new process that didn't work. Yeah. And the factory dies, but you have to meet quotas anyway. And if you succeed in acquiring enough algae to meet your quota, they put you in charge of a block of factories. No. And it just keeps getting bigger that's, and bigger. Until, that's mind-numbing. Until either society collapses around you or you just fail and get killed. <laughs> One of the two happens. That's not even fun. Yeah, no, it's not even fun. This is why I never tried to run it with you guys. <laughs> that I, one was well, a little bit too far into the uh, dystopian nightmare. <laughs> I know. So to be fair, though, in, in my and Zach's defense, we would probably try and derail it as quickly as possible. <laughs> Oh, for sure. And you would you would either like you I don't think you could keep a straight face with us. You would probably have to like kill our characters off to make it continue. Well that's now, okay, because you have a six pack, so That's right. I know. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but Jackie like, Jackie actually might win that one. <laughs> she might. She has proven to be surprisingly good at paranoia. <laughs> Which is a little disturbing. I, 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 you don't know my wife as well as I do. Sleep, so sleep lightly. That's That's, I have a feeling one day I'll have to start saying, "Hello, friend Jackie. How was your day? What tasks do you have for me today?" I will gladly complete them. But anyways, before we get into the rabbit hole, or, or I'm sorry, the perfect society, which is uh, 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 paranoia. Uh, let's do a little bit of uh, recap, James. What have you been up to, man? Oh, I've been working the night shift this last week, so oh, not a lot. I read an excellent uh, lit RPG book by Maxime Durand called nice. uh, Kairos. Okay. It's uh, three novels, and it's a Greek-inspired lit RPG. Oh, that's cool. And it's actually really, really good. Okay. Uh, they, it takes place after what they call the, uh, the Tetramachia, where humanity rose up and killed off most of the Greek pantheon. Mm -hmm. And in the process, some of them were able to become gods, some of them weren't. Poseidon floods most of the world as vengeance. Oh. And it starts out with this uh, kind of archipelago, like archipelago nation. Okay. And the main character is like the son of a pirate. And can, can I ask you, is it on uh, Audible? It is on Audible, and it is also on um, Kindle. Okay. Yeah, Kindle on the way to, oh. It's on there. So I enjoyed that a lot. It's only three books. It's a pretty quick read. They're okay. shortish. I enjoyed that a lot. You also read like a marathon runner. So let's be honest, James, and be nice to everybody else. If you're like me, it'll probably take you six months to get to the three books. Okay. It took me three days to finish the series. But... See what I mean? <laughs> Your job basically is to read things. So let's be honest, okay? <laughs> um, I used to be like that, and it's it's still like my brain is now. It's like, oh, I got to like take a break every once in a while. But um, check it out. See if it's out at your uh, local libraries, guys. I know I, I have found some of your recommendations 
quite easily in libraries, which I'm kind I, of surprised. I had no idea that they actually existed in print form. I thought these were all just online, but or you can search around online. I'm sure they, dude. I'm sure they've got it. At, like, if you want to find the books somewhere, I'm sure they've got them online. But, because that's the nice thing about the library. So nice, uh, a plug for a public library, uh, the Cape Public Library. Since my mom worked there at one point, um, she did a lot of the interlibrary loans. And all you have to do is say, hey, I would like to read this book. It's not in your catalog. And they're like, we'll ask around in all of Missouri. And they'll say, oh, hey, we have this one up in Kansas City. Give us a second. We'll, we'll get it to you in just a like, couple weeks. Or it might be not even a week. Maybe it's just like a, week, a single week. And then next week it's there and you can rent it, borrow it for three weeks, read it, and then send it back. It's very nice. I used to do that in college to get research material and stuff because they can yep. come up with anything if you give them a week to show up. Yep. For it to show up. You just got to pre-plan a little ahead of time. So yeah, it's it's. Like I said, I think a lot of people, this is another rare, rare tangent, but I think our public library system is probably one of the better things that we have uh, compared to the rest of the world. It's it's really kind of interesting how well it works, and you can pretty much get anything you want to read if you don't have access to the internet. Or, like I said, maybe you're like us. You like some fairly rare stuff that's not necessarily online, which... Yes. You know, for younger people, it's easy to think that everything's online. But it's not. not the, case. the vast majority of stuff is online, but you can probably find about 75% of stuff online. Yeah. But if you want to find like rare, rare manuscripts, texts, things like that, they will, they, a lot of times they'll let you bring it. They'll bring it to the library, like in a special container. They'll have somebody with you and you can look through it essentially mm -hmm. it's and it's you just have to give them a legitimate reason why you want to look at it obviously <laughs> it's like not be like i want to read the first uh the first you know uh you know luther's uh first printed bible they will not do that for you obviously no. it's like i need the anarchist cookbook for a book report it's like... Cook book <laughs> report yes no we will sh we shall not be doing that and, and by the way you are also now placed on the watch list so yes, have fun with that quickly. so um, the other thing that I'm going to be doing later this week is I'm going to play Wrath of the Lamb. Nice. It came out. I haven't touched it yet because I've been playing Minecraft because, like I said, I've been sleep deprived a, and I need something zen. And I've it's a zen it. moment. It's okay. That's right. I've been building a giant love. Do you do you light your candles and stuff while you watch it and sit in your bathrobe? For the Wrath of the Lamb, I might. I might. Just I your need, bathrobe, though, I need though, a right? very rare steak to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> have you watched any of like uh, Northern Lion or any of those guys playing? I have bit? watched a little bit of it. It looks really good. The, the only downside I've seen so far about it is apparently the replay value is not very high. It's the only downside. <sighs> yeah, it's it's got this base and cult building mechanic to it yeah. that it's not a pure roguelike like you know Isaac where you can just very much blast a it over, um, and over and over again. What was it? The uh, oxygen, please. Like oxygen not included. Oxygen they mentioned not included. it has some of those type of base building you know, like meeple managing things going yeah. on. And so, yeah, I can see how the cult managing part of the aspect of it and like the tech tree unlocking, it's not going to be one of those sink a thousand hours into it roguelikes, yeah. but I think it'll be a lot of fun. They anyway. do, they do have, from what I've seen in it, uh, from some of the gameplays, they do have an endless mode, like an endless floor mode. Like if you just want to go and kill a bunch of stuff, okay, they do have that kind of mode. I have a feeling that they're going to probably push out a few updates here and there oh, I'm sure they they'll are. probably expand it a little bit um because it has been even though it has kind of that lackluster type stuff a little bit on regards to like the gameplay a little bit or the length of the gameplay at least it has been very well received from what i've gathered this apparently Definitely. the biggest thing that people are calling is that the soundtrack is just bonkers good yeah and we said this before i would rather have a game that plays great for 20 hours than have one that yeah. is worthless for 50 hours like a short, good game is fine. That yeah. Is, that is fine. Yeah. That, sometimes a self, like you said, a self-contained game is, 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 it's, it's like having the chance to eat some delicate, like tiny piece of Wagyu as opposed to having <laughs> a 32 ounce tomahawk steak. It's like sometimes <laughs> one is going to taste better than the other, even though it won't last as long. Yeah. So that's, that's the way I would always compare it to it. Or a giant, or how about 30, 32 ounces of mutton chop? How about that? There's something satisfying about finishing a game. Yeah. I mean, The Binding of Isaac is a game, it's a wall that you bang your head into. Yeah. You do it for a month, and then you get bored of it, and you come back in six months, and you do it again. I don't know what you're talking but about, you're James. Never, but you're never going to finish it. Says I'm sure there are some people watch me. Who, I'm sure there's some people who 100% of it, but I'm never going to do it. That's because you don't have the dedication. You, have, you want to be the very best, the best there ever was. Gotta get all the items. That's my real time. Right, you gotta catch them all. 
Anyways, I, could, I couldn't make it work. <laughs> it is. I'm gonna be honest with you. Having having restarted that game three separate times, it is it is a hundred percent like banging your head against the wall. But so so is that pretty much everything you've done? That's about up? it. I haven't been doing too much this last week. Yeah, night shift switching over to night shifts were always the roughest time for me too. You just you kind of just like brr, and just kind of like zone out a little bit, try to find something that's well and that's good enough to keep you awake, so you can switch exactly. over. You need something to do for a couple of long nights while everyone else is asleep. And this time that was Minecraft. Yep, it's all um, matters. So hey, it's something to do. It's good. Um, on my end, uh, I've actually what a Jackie and I fan. We started watching The Sandman, which is on Netflix. How was it? I watched a couple of trailers for it, and the trailers looked good. Really good. Yeah. It's really good. It's so. I was I'm, worried. The original we're, author like directed it, which is a good plus. So. I think so. I don't know if I don't know. Did he direct it? I don't know if it's. it's I know he, he was, was involved. He was deeply involved in it. Very, Neil Gaiman was very heavily involved, from I remember. And um, he's directed a lot of shows before, so he's not like yes. naive to the television medium. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Of, well, that's the, so that's the thing he did. Um. What was it? Uh, the life's life and time. No, that's the book within the book. It's um, the one about the angel and the demon, which are on Earth together, and they're like best friends. I can't remember what it is, but he wrote it with Terry Pratchett, and I cannot remember what the name of the book is, but it's really good. Okay. Um, they actually started to make a TV show about it, and he is involved in that one. That was pretty recent, though. But there's some other ones that he did a while back, like he did a BBC version of Neverwhere. Which is just, you can tell it's really 90s. Um, yeah, but he's done some BBC shows before, too. Like, he was involved with uh, Doctor Who for a while. And... Yeah, which he has some really good, like, uh, really good episodes that he wrote. Oh, yeah, and I was, he wrote I was pleasantly really surprised. Good. So, But um, we're on episode six. Um, really enjoyed it. They've, they're starting to weave, they're weaving all the stories together. And so, as opposed to it being kind of like, this is the end of this chapter, this is the end of this chapter, it all kind of flows together a lot more. I figure they would cut out a lot of the side story. Bits, they have. Like, like the whole Cuckoo storyline. and like, I don't know yet. We'll start to see, I guess. But I will be I will be pleasantly surprised. I will give... Usually for TVs, they want more tightly written characters than yeah. comic books, which kind of lend themselves to the side stories. Well, I, what I really hope is at one point, hopefully, I, I think... They haven't renewed it for a season two. I really hope they do a season two, um, and they kind of fill reception. it out a little bit. What's that? It's gotten a good reception. You're not the first person I've heard about. Oh it. yeah, people are buzzing about it. Oh no, absolutely. Um, and I think the guy that they picked for uh, uh, to play Dream is just stellar. He's got the tone down perfectly. Mm-hmm. He he looks like him. I w- I honestly wish they would have gotten like James McAvoy because he does the audiobook <laughs> version of Dream. Yeah. And like Cat Dennings does uh, Death's voice. Okay. But the thing is, I also like the gal that does. Uh, it, she plays Death in this, and she's re- she does a really good job. I don't know where I don't know where she's from, but I love I've loved all the people. And they are changing a few things here and there. Like for whatever reason, they made um, they made John Constantine in this Joanna Constantine, so it's a woman a little bit. It doesn't yeah, bother me any. They probably couldn't afford the rights to John Constantine. Well, maybe, um, but the thing, yeah, that's well, the thing is... Doesn't Fox have Constantine because they made the movie? I don't know. That might have been one of those like things. I, I doubt they could afford the rights to Constantine, so they made a similar character, which is slightly different. Yeah, that, that might have been one of those things, too, but the thing is, they also have some pretty decent actors in this, man. Like, the guy that they had play, um, oh, the crazy guy that stole, that has uh, Dreams Ruby, is he was like a pretty big actor back in the 90s and early 2000s. He's a British actor. I can't, he's a Professor Lupin from the Harry Potter movies. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. He's, um, I can't remember his name, but, but he's... Some big name so they get some decent named, like, decent, like, uh, people. And they even have the guy that plays, uh, oh, uh, the Lannister. Uh, he was in Game of Thrones. He's got a very stereotypical British, like, highbrow british kind of guy mm-hmm. voice he's very good at like military roles but yeah. he plays that guy uh one of the characters there too it's really good too so i need to check it out but... i would highly recommend it um in regards to anything else um let me think uh started to watch the she hulk tv show which just came out uh i'm still on the fence about it i yeah. don't know it's it's interesting to say the least 
I want to wait and see how it goes forward. It's only like 35, 40 minutes of an episode. So okay. I think they could have made it a little bit longer, maybe. I don't know. I feel like maybe it's just a little much to shove into one TV, one episode. The dialogue is pretty good, though. I will admit that. So that one of the okay. this is one of the things I found out. Apparently, the the lady that wrote the Pickle Rick episode, mm-hmm. Rick and Morty, which is one of the <laughs> biggest ones, she is the showrunner for this. Okay. So, needless to say, the dialogue is it's quick, it's snappy, it's funny, well, it's, um, it's really good, and I will admit that. Um, I will I will hold off judgment to give it a couple more episodes and see how it goes. Um, but yeah, that's. And TV shows wise, that's pretty much all I've I've been up to. Uh, video game wise, uh, you mentioned it earlier. Uh, I went back into the realm, which is Isaac. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to get a couple more things unlocked. Uh, this it's been my pressure release this last week. Um, yeah. Since, like I was telling you earlier, Jack, he's getting ready for school to start back up again. It's a little bit, a little stressful in the household um, <laughs> while she's trying to get everything going because she's got to deal with the administration's BS and all that jazz. So uh, that's what I do to de-stress. Uh, <laughs> I I go, I delve into the base Isaac's basement, and I have a good time. That's what I do. So, um, but yeah, that's uh, I've gotten quite a few unlocked. I actually finally beat greed mode with um kane which he's actually surprisingly hard to beat with kane is it kane might have been the other one who's got the luck foot oh that's kane that is kane so it might have been kane then yeah so yeah the thing with greed mode is like some of those the greed mode unlocks tend to be really really good for the characters they you get them for like yeah they unlock a new feature and a lot of them are frankly like patching bad characters yes and so you almost want to do the greed mode before you do the rest of their unlocks. Would have been nice to know beforehand, but I, I'm like, I'm hitting it afterwards. <laughs> so it's okay, though. I, I, I Like Maggie's greed mode lets her always start with the speed pill. Yeah. Which, which really, really helps her out. A hundred percent. You know, it's, it's, that's the thing is like a lot of times if you don't research at all, you're just playing through the dime, you know, dumb luck. That's kind of what I end up doing. So, but um, other than that, I think that's, everything that i've been up to uh are you ready to go into our our perfect world so oh, a whole new world as it were so so paranoia is a yeah give us a little background james paranoia is an anti-rpg right so yeah it's a dystopian science fiction tabletop game it was designed and written by uh, greg kostikin dan gerber and eric goldberg published in 1984 by west end games originally uh since 2004 the game was bought back by the original developers i took it away from west end games we'll get to that later Mm -hmm. and now it's under mongoose publishing it won the origin awards for its first year it was out in 1984 for best role-playing game uh it's in the origin awards hall of fame since 2007 what makes it different is it's more of a competitive game than a cooperative game you are highly encouraged to act on your own interests, you are highly encouraged to betray and backstab and kill the other players. And it's got this really delightfully kind of lighthearted, tongue-in-cheek tone. Well, let me ask you this, James. So where did you first run into this? Because I know that since this has been out since 84, which is three years before either of us were born, yes. um, shows how old we are. Uh, we're old fuddy-duddies at this point. So where, where did you first encounter this? Because I know we've been playing it so... To put it in retrospect, you know, in a perspective, everybody, James and I have been playing D and D probably since what high school? Since high school, yeah. high school so a while. For a while there. We did, we mostly three point five stuff like that, and mm-hmm. then I guess maybe waste. I kind of started branching a little bit in college, a little bit. Well, and for us too, paranoia was in a weird spot at that point, which like we'll talk about later. Mongoose Games was going under, yeah, and dying out whenever we were in high school. And so Paranoia was just wasn't really known at that yeah. point. Kind of got Paranoia out, XP, yeah. which kind of rebooted the franchise that uh, Mongoose published, came out, I think, in 2007. So it just wasn't really around when we were in high school. So I found it for the first time whenever Critical Role did a Paranoia one-shot. Oh. And their version of Paranoia leans towards the slapstick end, and you can play Paranoia everywhere from, like, Three Stooges slapstick-level comedy to dystopian nightmare this game isn't even fun anymore. 
you know, most five. people play somewhere in the middle. Yes. <laughs> but it, it goes both ways. But yeah, that was the first time I ran into it and I saw it and I thought, this is so cool. I have to play it. So let me, let me ask you, when did, do you kind of know roughly about when that was coming out? Um, Cause that critical, critical, that was critical role has been around actually quite a while, right? That was, I was in my postgraduate education, I think when that one came out. So seven years ago, something like that. Yes. Seven or eight years ago, some 2016. It's what it says is when they yeah. they posted it. So, oh wow, yeah. So that's a good probably six years. So yeah. six years ago, it's roughly been quite a while. That's kind of interesting. So that would be probably one of the first. And that was when the 25th anniversary edition for the game were coming out. Yeah. yeah. See, now I remember it. Now that you say that, I remember that because they all. I remember. The they all dress set. up in red jumpsuits. And, and it's like a white like set and everything. And it's like supposed to be clean and pure and things like that. And didn't they have they had some big names with like they had a uh, Will Wheaton was playing with them, didn't he? They did. And was it Felicia Day too? Yeah, she was in that one too. Okay. Yeah. That was back when they were all a happy family before Critical Role split off. Yeah, Will Wheaton and Felicia Day were both in that. And they had like the guest dungeon master for it. I can't remember what he was it he clearly knew Brian, what he was doing? Was it the Brian guy with the Not kind of poofy hair and the yeah, glasses? Yeah, it was Brian. He yeah. he he comes in every once in a while and he does some stuff. So yeah, I think he's still with um, uh, Eek and Sundry. So, mm-hmm. but but yeah, that's kind of a cool concept though. That cause, so after you got a hold of it, I think the first time we ever played it was whenever you were doing. I think you were down. I was working in. Uh, I was living in. I was living in Park Hills at the time, and you were living in Farmington. I think so when we and I came down. We came down and played it a couple times. Maybe yeah. It was, yeah, because and that might have been the first time I think we ever actually played that. Um, and that that was, but then I think it was like a long hiatus. It was a long hiatus because we I think the next time we actually sat down and played it with you was whenever we did it with our current D&D group a year or two ago. Yeah, which, to be fair, I think they've had a blast because... We played it twice with them already. Oh, yeah. And, and to put it in perspective, um, you know, Zach had a little bit of background uh, in RPGs, but, like, Tara doesn't... didn't have any background. Shanna really didn't have mm-hmm. any at that point. She had... well, other than with us, right? Yeah. Um, and Jackie really didn't, other than, you know, just playing with us... I wouldn't call them how how it was it was just hardcore nerds. <laughs> I would know. I would call that. I would call. I would call them um, if if the opportunity presents themselves. Sure, I'll try it. Kind of people. Yeah, pretty much. That's that's kind of what I, I would I would I would put it as. They would probably not be playing it if we weren't pushing them to. A hundred percent. But but the fact that they they went in and we suggested this, they have they all had a a, a blast. From I remember seriously, and paranoia is a little bit weird. It's different. Yeah, it, it's rules light. Well, it can be rules light. I think it's best played rules light. A hundred percent. So, um, well, now that we kind of figured out, you know, like you know, the origins a little bit. Do you want to tell me kind of what what was the setting? What's the Let's setting? Let's introduce like? the setting a little bit. I don't think people will understand it without that. So, yeah. the game is this dystopian future where humanity lives in bunkers underground. And you live in this bunker called Alpha Complex. It's been controlled by a computer program, which is named Friend Computer. It's a civil service AI who's like a literal realization of like the influencing machine schizophrenic yeah. nightmare. <laughs> the ga- the computer is the principal antagonist and agonist for the story. Yep. And uh, also kind of serves as the voice of the dungeon master. Now the computer perceives its society to be perfect. Emphasis on perceives. Yes, 100%. And sees everything that's a threat to its society as traitors, and traitors are punished with summary execution. Um, so things like the outdoors, things like the history yep. of the world, knowledge of the rules by the players. Yeah. Uh, all these things are threats to the perfect society, and there are things that the computer hates. Yeah. Um, there's also mutants and secret societies. The original version of the game was very focused on communists being a threat. Well, Usually in a very right. slapstick way. Remember, this came out in the 80s, right after the Cold War. And During the Cold War. Who doesn't like shooting up communists, right? Yeah. But <laughs> the more recent versions of the game have added more stuff, like, you know, more post-consumerist, um, like, you know, advertising apocalyptic type themes. Yep. They've 
in the very most recent version of the game started phasing out the communist thing in favor of uh, terrorists. Yep. Which, again, it's the same idea. It's just taking a little bit D- of a more modern spin on it. Different name for the same thing, basically. So, to deal with all these threats that the computer perceives in its society, it has conscripted a group of just random individuals yep. called troubleshooters, whose job is to find trouble and shoot it. Um, <laughs> quite, quite literally, and that's the one thing. One of the that's one of the sidebar here, like yeah. that's one of the things I really enjoy about like this game is they use straight like when you think it's like an analogy or like the name they have. You think it's a mac an af- acronym? No, no, it's a troubleshooter. They want you to shoot the trouble. Or it's a six pack. No, you have a six pack of people. Yes, <laughs> clones to choose from. Like that's all you have. So, it's very direct. It's fun. Yeah, though. and so players have six lives in each campaign. They have six different clones, and if you die in the course of the game, be reborn as one of your clones. Yep. Uh, the central conceit of the game, though, is that players typically get, frankly, impossible, self-contradictory missions from the computer. Things which will obviously kill them if they do it. And so part of the game is to try to fulfill the computer, the, the letter of the computer's mission without committing treason in a way that can get you caught and get you killed. That's right. Now, at the same time, the other players can get rewarded if they catch you committing treason. And uh, there is a lot of incentive to sell you out. Sometimes even to make things up. Yep. And to add another level to it, everyone's a member of a secret society, which, of course, is treasonous as well. Yep. And that gives you some cross-purposes. So maybe you're part of the computer freaks and you believe in hacking computers. Or you're part of the machine club, the machine, uh, the church of the machine, which believes the computer's a god. Or you're part of the death lovers, want to blow things up. But your secret society gives you a kind of bonus mission that you need to accomplish at the same time as the main mission. <laughs> Usually, the two are contradictory to each other as well. That is that is one of the fun and things. So that's the thing: yeah. trying to get everything done and not get killed at the end of the game is very very difficult. Yeah, it is. It is one of those games where it's it's comical in a way that they have these things that are at such odds with each other. So, like prime example, like like you said, normally the one thing that comes to mind was the last game we played with each other. We had to go. We were supposed to go and guard this um, super tank thing or whatever it was, yeah. and we had. But at the same time, I was supposed to go in there, and my job was to destroy it. You know, and I actually, I think I, I, I think I actually won that one, didn't I? I think you did. Someone but, blew it up. If that was me. That was you. It was me because uh, I because w- Eck was trying to like hack it. I think you were trying to destroy it. Kelly yeah. wanted to save it. Yes, and like I said, it's, <laughs> and that's the thing that's like, it, it, even though you you were all working together to try and complete friend computer's mission, right? you're still at the same time you're still trying to like oh do i do i try and do what friend computer is telling me to do or do i try and work on my other mission at the same time or like how do i get away with it at the same time or is there are, and that that's the thing though that the mission the mission parameters are so vague <laughs> that you can literally as long, if you can think about how to do it how to complete your mission you can you can get there it doesn't matter how you get there it does not matter how you get there. As long as you don't get caught in the process, you can do whatever you want. That is exactly 100% true. And that's so. the thing. is like Everyone also is a mutant of some type. Yeah. It's like uh, living underground has made people to mutants. Hopefully you've got a good mutant power. Uh, yeah, my yeah, favorite that's... one is Doom. <laughs> <laughs> like Doom with like three exclamation points. Yeah. What does the power do? It causes Doom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you roll well, you might get to decide where the Doom happens, but probably not. <laughs> Things just happen. Oh my god! Like you can have really great powers, like you know, shooting lightning bolts, or really bad ones, like having sticky skin. Yes, (laughs) because if something like that's the thing, though, like so, if you're just like walking along and you don't have control of your your powers, right, and you just randomly touch something and it gets stuck to you, or say you get stuck to a wall and like friend computer sees you or somebody sees you, like they're like, oh, they they like they they might you know rat you out or. Maybe they're like... Or maybe they'll blackmail you, yeah. Maybe they'll blackmail you, or maybe they do like a super secret hand signal. You find, oh, somehow they knew my society's hand signal, and maybe they're the same society as that, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're the 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 arch rival of my society that's trying to get... <laughs> it's why I love this game, it's right? A, it's just a ton of fun. And uh, the whole society is built around security clearances, where yes. you start as infrared, which is black security, and then you kind of progress through rainbow colors to like red, yellow, green, blue. Yes. Other like the ultraviolet, which is white. Yeah. The ultraviolet people are the ones who can actually reprogram the computer. 
uh, you start as red, which is the troubleshooter level. Yeah. And all these levels have different access to information, right? Yeah. But the problem is you're never told what the information is. You are not. And that's the other <laughs> thing, too, is that this is a bureaucratic <laughs> nightmare society where to get anything done requires mountains of paperwork and ass kissing to that's make right. it happen. And so the first time I played this, which was whenever I was up in Kirksville with my group up there, we did the same stealth train mission you did yeah. for your first time. And uh, this guy, Jared, he was sitting there. He's like, I've never had so much fun filling out paperwork in my life. Like he had like his arm had gotten blown off, but he wasn't actually killed. And so he <laughs> wanted to get a replacement. And so I whip out like four forms that I printed. In advance. Yes. I'm like, here, here's the form acquisition form. Here's the application for equipment. Here's the application for medical aid. Fill these out. <laughs> and so he sat there for like five minutes filling out, you know, government paperwork <laughs> to get his arm replaced. <laughs> <laughs> so true though that's the problem right it's it's one of those things that you just kind of think about it's like i want to put this mailbox in my front yard all right you need to fill out these four these 18 fail paperwork did you have you somebody come by and survey your land for you first they're like uh i'm just gonna put that mailbox in my front yard and <laughs> no <laughs> i'm just gonna do it and we'll see if anyone cares enough to find me for it. Exactly. That's kind of why I say about it sometimes. It's just like, oh my God, it's a bureaucratic nightmare. But it is it is one of those fun games. So I will ask you this. Let me ask you this, James. They've had several iterations of this game since 1984. And it's it's been a lot of changes over the time, mainly because there have been a lot of like copyright issues, or how it has been, not copyright issues, um, owner Owner law. I, is it copyright? Yeah. Cause, there's cause... some of it's copyright. Some of it's just bad writing. Like, so that's worth. Yeah. So the first edition, like we said, came out in 85, Four. 84. That was the one that won a bunch of game awards. Like I said, it was the first RPG of the time. And it's still probably the one that does it best that encouraged this dark humor, this backstabbing. And we'll talk more about the themes in a little bit, but all these very dystopian themes into it. Now, like I said, West End Games was the publisher for that, and whatever they did the publisher, they managed to pick up the rights to the game, too. And so they released a second edition in 1987, which initially was actually very well received. The rules were a little bit lighter, they're a little bit easier to play. Mm -hmm. um, it emphasized a slightly more humorous take on the way it was going, kind of emphasizing fast, fast rules. Now... They continued releasing stuff for it in what a lot of fans were calling the meta plot. And they were doing that thing where people ruin a good thing by trying to break new ground. Yeah. Where they introduced, like, you know, Alpha, Alpha Complex without the computer, time traveling Alpha Complex. There was yeah. a mission where you, like, became wizards and fought orcs and stuff. And, and it little... became completely and totally unrecognizable as a game. Yeah. And it got horribly unpopular. And uh, they developed a very bad reputation for that one. Well, it almost seems like they're pushing material just to try to keep selling things and stay in the limelight. Which, in the which, fact, this is kind of one of the contradictions of being like a an RPG company, right? You got to keep releasing splat books yep. and material to make money. The more you release material, the faster you hasten the inevitable demise of your rule system. Whenever it just becomes too complicated for anyone to care about anymore. 3.5. 3.5, exactly. <laughs> Which was one of the more successful editions. It lasted a good What are you talking time. about, James? I love 4th edition. <laughs> I love it so much, I want to put a pillow across its head and smother it. Yes. These original editions <laughs> have more in common with like a 1st edition, 2nd edition, D&D &D type thing. Yeah. Um, there was a 5th edition that West End Games released in 1995. It is so universally reviled that it's been called a unproduct by the writers of the current edition this makes me so much like nobody what... talks about it nobody <laughs> plays it everyone just hates it can you uh, find it somewhere so we can look i just want to see how bad uh, it, is. it is probably on some of these rpg compiling things this took the uh it pretty much completely departed from the dystopian themes and it had like a vampire the masquerade nice. you know book so and let's like it, it would it wasn't a it wasn't a commentary on society anymore it became a commentary on pop so culture, you got on here which is it, a completely different game you got in here that is so reviled so the company saw a 90 percent decline in sales yes so, so i'm this guessing game was, this game was so bad that it put west end games out of business 
they started to release a third edition, which, yes, that came after the fifth edition, which was after the second edition. Yes, makes um, the sense. third edition, they were going to try and release it in 1999, after the horrible failure of the fifth edition to try and save their company. They even uh, put out some samples in some gaming expos that summer, but then they all of a sudden shut up about it and stopped talking about it. And it turned out that, one, the company was going under, which they hadn't told anybody yet, but two... Yeah. The original developers of the game were so infuriated with what they'd done with their product that they actually banded together and came up with enough money to buy the rights back. Which, that's the said. And so the third edition was yeah. never released. Thank God. <laughs> so fast forward a few more years, the original game designers uh, gave out a license to Mongoose Publishing, who have currently the rights to the game. Yep. To make a new version. They called it Paranoia XP. It came out in the early 2000s. It was obviously a riff on Windows XP. Yes. They did get a cease and desist from Microsoft in 2005. Microsoft would never do such a thing. <laughs> what are you and talking they about? Remove, they play well with everybody, James. They had to remove the XP from the title. <laughs> what are you talking about? I, I think it was an excellent choice. <laughs> in my opinion, a lot, of the best, a lot of the best books and scenarios came from this edition. This is where they added the idea of you know the secret society recursion they added the idea of being parts of different parts of the society they included more capitalist themes in this one so things like you know alpha society being on credits the omnipresent advertising of like bouncy bubble beverage and all these That's different right. all these different products you, that you are you, required to use because yes. happiness is mandatory have you taken your happiness pill today you seem to be a bit down <laughs> This is so. This is very, very uh, similar to things that I've seen, and that's like the, the um, mandatory bonus duty that that came during this edition, yes, where yeah. each person has an, is an officer too. Like someone's a team leader, someone's the happiness officer, someone's so, a hygiene officer. If you like this kind of stuff, there's a uh, video game that came out a while ago that has like a similar theme. I wasn't super into it, but I'm gonna try and go back and do it. Uh, we happy few. Okay. Yeah. So it's very similar, but they take they take they're required to take their pills every so often, mm -hmm. and but. It, it does that thing where it basically has an overlay, basically makes everything look super happy and ha happiness. And if you don't, and you if you don't take it, everything starts to become gray and dull. Yeah. And it's kind of a cool concept, but this kind of reminded me of that a it little bit. Have, they might have thought about it from this because that's uh, one of the conceits of the game too: is that the society is perfect, and anyone who is in a perfect society should be happy. And so, just not being happy and clean is enough to get punished and help accomplish. That's right. So it's so let me. <laughs> Let's keep going and finish off. Anyway, the... we'll finish this off real quick. So yeah. anyway, XP also brought in some more modern technology, like personal digital companions, and you know they updated the game a little bit. There was a 25th anniversary edition in 2009. Yep. If XP was third edition, the 25th anniversary was 3.5. It was just a little bit more polished, a little bit better. They slimmed down some of the rules. They got rid of the service group thing that was just too complicated. <laughs> Uh, they, it was a very short printing run. It's actually very hard to get a hold of even digital copies of the 25th anniversary. Really? Edition. Wow. Well, they, they posted it on Mongoose Games now. You can buy PDFs officially, but before their PDF store went up, it was actually very hard to find that one. I would love to try to find it, see if they're able to print one off. Yeah. That would be nice, even like a bound version, because that would be mm -hmm. really nice. Is that That is one of my favorite versions of the game. The current version is called the Red Clarence Edition. It was also through Mongoose. It was a Kickstarter in 2014. I don't think it actually came out until 2019. Yeah, no, it was pretty recent from my uh, memory. Yeah. It has updated the themes a little bit. Like I said, they've gone from communist to terrorists. They've, again, reemphasized the, the post-capitalistic type themes. And they've incorporated some new rules to it. So, for example, during character creation mm -hmm. now, um, you can have like a plus five to a minus five in skills. <laughs> But the person to the left of you decides where those go, and yes. like it, uh, I think we we kind of re there is some backstabbing that. built into character creation itself. That's and right. It's actually a lot of fun. It really kind of sets up the theme, and even like the turn order during combat scenarios, there's a bluffing element to it. it yeah, it really doubled down on the part where you guys are fighting each other. Because oh, I know. a little, a little and, that, and I think it's actually a very worthy addition. 100%. So that was another little mechanic I forgot we forgot to mention earlier when they first started. So, in, you know, normally in like these these other RPGs, the higher you roll, you want to have a higher stat, right? But mm -hmm. in these, you want to have a lower stat, so the more points you have in the stuff, is this correct? The higher the stat you have in it, the worse you'll actually do in it, isn't that correct? 
because you want to have a lower roll, correct? Yeah, and that was how it was in the XP edition. It's a D20 based system, but okay. it's going for lower rolls. Yeah. The new version is a dice pool based system. Okay. So like for each plus you have, you get to roll an extra D6 and it's successes or fails. It's like the Star Wars RPG. Oh, okay. So it's, I, yeah, yeah. We, we should... it's, it's a dice pool system. It, so it works out pretty you, well. you know why they did that, right? So oh, I... one of the creators of this, uh, the I can't remember which one it was. It was the gentleman with the G last name. He actually worked on the Star Wars RPG. Oh, actually, help bring it out. So he is actually he cross worked at it, but now he has his own company, or he, I believe he consults for through has an old his gaming consulting company essentially. But now, but yeah, mm-hmm. he he worked with uh, to make the Star Wars RPG. That's why you see a lot of similarities if you yeah. look at those. So and then the last thing that's come out, well didn't come out was paranoia happiness is mandatory it was a video game released for the pc in december 2019 on the epic game store it was uh, developed by cyanide and uh, black shamrock studios and it was an isometric real-time rpg if you've played any of those like squad based shooter yep. type things it was similar to that but it came down in mid-january like a month later Completely removed, no explanation, no one's ever talked about it. I'm guessing it was a licensing problem, nothing else really makes sense. By all accounts, the game was pretty mediocre, and it sounds like the developers of the original game are trying to protect their IP now, so maybe they pulled it, I I don't know. I can understand that a little bit, because it's it's kind of like with things like Lord of the Rings, right? That's that's Mm. definitely a, a, a classic example. If you let your IP kind of run wild, you can, might get some really good things, but you might get some really, really bad things, <laughs> as in 5th edition. And I guess they probably were shown something for like a like a beta test or something like that, and they were just like, nope, no, we don't like the one, we don't like the way this game plays out and whatnot. Or maybe just didn't have the the fun jovial kind of thing to it that well, you normally have. Single player too, and so like, how do you how do you play a single player game when this is so interactive? On it's so dependent upon how you interact with other people, right? Well, and that's the thing. So really, you can find some reviews and stuff on YouTube of like early things and see some videos of it, and it's like it's got a paranoia skin on top of a pretty generic, you know, real time yeah. RPG like tactical thing, and. It, I don't think it felt like paranoia, and I, because you're right, the, the cooperative betrayal part of it is the game. Like it's, I think it would be much better if you made it a multiplayer game. Yes, and you did it like a traditional RPG thing, but you were playing with each other. But you could have basically, it's essentially kind of like have a like a like a D and D like uh, uh, D and D you know, a character builder type thing, but you would play with each other online, essentially. I, mean, I think a procedurally generated game would be perfect for, for Paranoia. Oh, yeah. Because while there are some excellently written modules, like I said, the Stealth Train is one I would definitely recommend for someone trying it for the first time. It doesn't need to have it. No. You get a random mission that in some way is impossible. Go to You go to research and development and you get some ridiculous devices that will probably kill you. And then you go try to do your mission without getting in trouble. Like, like I said, this would be perfect for a procedurally generated like multiplayer roguelike type experience. I think it would be great. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. But let, let me ask you this. So what, what would you expect out of... Would, would, so would you recommend this to somebody that is never played an rpg before do you think they would be able to play something like this uh, i think you could play it i think that especially the red clearance the newest version it's included like some deck based card type stuff the rules are much shorter like 20 or 30 pages and most of that's dm advice i think that one would probably be more approachable for someone who's not played before okay um I think the game is at its best when you're using it as a break for people who are long-time RPG players. Yes. It's a chance to not have to work together. It's a chance to embrace the craziness and not try to be playing in character or sticking to a thing. Um, but yeah, you can definitely play it first time. Like I said, we've had first-time RPG players play in our groups. And like I said, it's yeah. rules light enough that it's not a problem. Yeah. The only thing the player really needs to know for this one is how to roll the dice. Because, like I said, 
the uh, it's actually in the rules that it is illegal for the players to know the rules. And yes. So on the dungeon master side of things, as long as you keep the crazy going, no one cares. No. Paranoia XP version, like I said, is one I, I think it's probably the best flavored edition. It is definitely one of the best written edition. But it has some very heavy rules in it that, frankly, you just don't need to use. No, not at all. And I think that was kind of one of the things that I heard about with some a couple of the new editions. I know they said with the most honestly with the like the 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 red clearance, what was it called again? The That's um, new one, the, red the newest one. newest one, the way they wrote it. Which I have a copy of. I, I ordered it. We need to play it sometime. But <laughs> they said it's, do that <laughs> it's more in that would be really fun. I would be hundred percent about that. <laughs> Um, they said, uh, they said it's got, if it was, if it was that one, it was the one, the 25th anniversary one. I, maybe it was that one, but they said the way it's written, it's more of like an old friend, like, like a conversational thing mm-hmm. as opposed to like, Hey, you know, as opposed to like now, whatever player X does this, do this, do Y, you know, it's like, it's not so, or like, Hey, you know, uh, whenever you, whenever you level up check, look at Appendency X to see which spells you can choose from. It's more of like a conversational thing. Like, what this, it flows so yeah. much more easily for a non, like, and that was RPG person. Like the XP version, like, it had rules in there. Yeah. With the appendixes and the tables and, like, level up progressions and, like, gear progressions and it was fully fleshed out so that if you wanted to run a long-term campaign yeah. and have it make sense and be self-consistent, you could do it. I don't think many people have actually done that. Like no. I said, I think Paranoia is at its best as a one-shot. 100%, yeah. Whether you're playing a more serious tone or a more crazy tone, I just, yeah, I don't think it's long-term material. No, no. So let me ask you this, right? So why would you... Th- why would you not want to do this as a long term? Well, so scenario? here let's let's talk someone through a through a mission, and you can kind of we'll talk to this <laughs> we'll talk to this stealth train scenario a little bit. Yeah, and you can interject what your experience as well as when you're yes, one hundred percent. Yes. So the the stealth train scenario starts like a lot of them do. You're at your complex where your team lives. Yep. You have to successfully get up and get dressed and make it out the door without betraying each other and killing people. Yes. Which, Usually some people die trying to get out of bed in the <laughs> yes, morning. Yes, that's that, 100%. Then you have to make your way to the mission office, which, as the dungeon master, what I do is I just rattle off the address real quick. And yes. And hopefully someone was paying attention, because if you're not, then you're going to have a lot of trouble. And, like, nothing is labeled. It doesn't look Nothing's like anything. Nothing's labeled. There's no information. You have to somehow get there, and you have a set time frame to make it there, or else you're all guilty of treason for abandoning your mission. That's right. And you die. <laughs> yes. And then you get there. And then <laughs> you uh, get a quick debriefing by this green-ranked officer. Yep. And he assigns you your mandatory bonus duties. So he gives out the mandatory bonus duty termination form. It's like a personality quiz. And you're supposed to fill this out. And it's supposed to determine who's going to be the team leader. And who's it means the nothing. It means nothing. I actually don't even read them. <laughs> I, uh, I've already picked in advance who I'm going to give each role to because <laughs> I've deliberately picked things that people are going to hate or really like. Yes. Because I, as the dungeon master, what's going on in the background here is I have pre-planned everything so that everyone will be in conflict. The last yes. thing the dungeon master wants is for everyone to work together. So like when people are making their characters, I have deliberately picked mutant powers and secret societies for them so that I know they will be fighting each other the entire time. Yes. Like I have quite deliberately make sure no one can be happy at the end of this game. To be fair, though, I think and that's a really good idea. That's a really good, you know, Uh, point put on here. Yeah, and usually whenever you get this mandatory bonus duty duty form, I'll slip in a self-termination request form. And then whenever someone tries to ask me why they have this in their pile, I'll say, well, it's important that you fill out every piece of paperwork you're given. And then when you fill it out, then you either get yourself killed, or if you were smart, you put someone else's name in and they get killed. I don't know what you're talking about. I never would have done that already. (laughs) Often I will also print out a copy of the Communist Manifesto and And stick it in someone's pile of paperwork and see if they're smart enough to just put it under the table or if they try to ask what it is. (laughs) Yes. To be fair, though, I think... So, There's like, the, we haven't yeah. even, like, started the game, and the stress level is already, like, an 8 or a 9 for the player. That's why I love it, because you're constantly <laughs> just like, like, why is this here? What is this going on? This shouldn't be like that. 
And so it's like you like you put these little like little tick you know you know little 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 cow traps here and there and see yeah. if people are gonna step on them yet. And it's it's really fun to and watch. Like, and as the mission them. goes on, like you go to like this underground train station, you trade off with this. Well, you gotta get to the there. train station yeah, first, which you also don't know where it's at. <laughs> Once you manage to find it and make it through the security clearance yep. area that you're not allowed to be in. Yes. And then you finally get there. You're at this empty train station where supposedly the stealth train is located. Yes. And uh, the other team just signs it off to you and leaves. Yes. And now you're in this empty train station, which may or may not contain a stealth train. You will never know. <laughs> and you can't find it. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. But it's supposed to be there. And you sign paperwork saying that you agreed it was there when you started your mission. That's so, right. Mm. And as like things go on, like just... you know, like a team of like a. <laughs> A group of Girl Scouts gets led through on like a tour, yeah. like a uh, a unstealthy train shows up. Like some yeah, people, it goes through it. Some, people, it some people drive in this like old coal powered monstrosity, and they're like, <laughs> "Is this the stealth train?" Because remember, this city is a bureaucratic nightmare, and this yeah. might be the stealth train. And if yes. it is, then you're about to die because it's yeah. definitely not stealthy. It's obviously not. Yeah, like, there's a terrorist attack. The military comes in. There's an inspector, I think, comes through. An one inspector point. comes through. Uh, tech support calls you up and tries to talk to you through checking all the systems, and they like are giving you explicit instructions that you're supposed to tell them what the what the panel shows. Yes. And this whole thing builds and builds and builds, and eventually, like the general shows up. Yeah. <laughs> and you better have your shit together at that point, or you're about to all die. Most likely, you will not, though. <laughs> <laughs> it usually comes down to who's good enough, like who is able to bluff their way through the scenario so they don't die. Exactly, and so like as the dungeon master for that, I'm just turning the screws a little bit more, yes, a little bit more, and a little bit more. And by the end of the session, everyone is like cranked up to eleven or twelve on their stress level trying to I, make this happen. I know, died five or six times a piece at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I was we were playing it the first time. I remember. That the only thing that kept me from my head exploding were the amp was the ample amounts of booze you were putting in front of me, which I think I don't know if it helped me or hurt me in the long run, but it it was definitely like you said. It, I know Jackie was losing her ever loving mind. <laughs> I remember she loved, but she it was more of like a it's more like a fun anxiousness. It's not like a actual like oh if things go bad. Every, someone's gonna get hurt. It's like, oh, this doesn't really matter. It's more of a fun kind of anxiousness. It's so it's, it's, it's good time. close enough to the pointless nonsense we do in our daily lives. You know, everyone does it. What, what are you yes. talking about, James? Everything I do in my life has I, meaning. I will just say that whenever we were playing that scenario, I could tell that you were like thinking of your real job while we were doing this. <laughs> it was, I it was mm, a little bit too close to some of the nonsense you've been asked to do. I think. <laughs> I don't have to do it anymore. It doesn't matter. It's not my job. But... It's not my job. I don't care anymore. I sit in front of my computer all day and I look at other people's code. I'm good. Okay. But, uh, uh, so much better. Yeah, it's, it's a stress relief. It lets you kind of experience these things that we all hate about our daily life and cathartically murder each other through them. Yeah, pretty much. And it's great. I don't know how many times my wife killed me in that game. <laughs> Quite a few, actually. I think you died three times that game, and it was all from Jackie. She, you. Yeah, and it wasn't even like she would just like rat me out from us random things. <laughs> it was like dumb stuff. Like he forgot, you know, from computer. I do believe that David or whatever my name was forgot to brush his teeth this morning. And they were like, "Clearly, this is next to next to perfect from computer, David." And then you would just kill me. <laughs> I'm just like, what? <laughs> I had to make sure Jackie had a good time. Oh, she, def she definitely had a good time there. I tell you that right now. But yeah, that's it's it's one of those great games. It's a great like one night party game, and it only really only takes you about three, maybe top like two to three hours if you want to it's make a quick, quick, yeah, pretty quick kind of session. Because the way it's set up, you kind of start to slowly kind of build, and eventually you're moving at a breakneck speed, right? Exactly, like it, it gains momentum as you're going through the scenario. I know, and I and I love that about it. So, but there's so many. I was after that when I remember I started looking at some of the other scenarios, and there is a a nice, like, you know, uh, a collection of stuff. There's you know, hundreds of them out there. Even just, just from what the ones that the, the, the creators made, but also a lot of the ones that, you know, individuals have made. So, mm -hmm. and like you said, looking through them, though, like you said, you, you do get both ends of the spectrum. You get some of them that are just amazingly fun and zany, mm -hmm. and some of them are, that are just like you said, I don't, I don't, why would anybody <laughs> want to work at an algae farm? This is so dumb. <laughs> it's very, it's a lot closer to that, uh, Early like yeah, 
early communist China type thing or like Soviet Russia type stuff. And I'm just like, oh, well, that was something that they introduced in the XP version. Yeah. Because second edition had given the game a bad na- a bad rep where it had become too zany and too lighthearted. They kind of tried to bring it to the middle. They wanted yeah. to bring it back. And so when they made the XP version, they explicitly said there were three different ways to play the game. You can play it Zap, which is the crazy yes. Three Stooges. You can play a classic, which is kind of in between, or you can play it straight, which is fuel, you know, full on bureaucratic nightmare hell. And they wrote scenarios for all three styles, and they they listed at the beginning of the scenario how you were intended to tone it, and you could try and pick one. Oof. And they they redeemed the reputation of the game. So it, that- it worked out for them in the future in that way, and now they don't even mention it. They because I think people have reached the point in RPGs now where people know that they can play it however they want. But. Yeah, I mean, well, because that's the thing, though, too. Like, so, like, in eighty in the 80s, you know, RPGs were still kind of in their infancy. They've only, they'd only been around for, what, maybe, you know, 10, 15 years, probably? Because yeah. Gygax, he, can't, he brought his stuff, came out in, like, the 60s, probably? Oh, no, that's that early. It was the 70s? Yeah, late set? Like late set? 70s late, or 80s, yeah. Late 70s? I mean, probably so, it was a fairly early RPG, as far as those things go. So, I mean, so, but that it was still in its infancy, right? Mm-hmm. So... You have all these things, it's like they, they, they don't really know where to go with it. And I love that they kind of took that as that hard turn in there. And I really hope to see some more stuff from these guys if they do decide to, you know, make other things. But I would say, like, a lot of these guys, paranoia is they're like the pinnacle of creation because a lot of these guys are in their almost late 50s, early 60s now. Yeah. So, uh, and this is the type of game that I don't think is ever going to really die. I don't no. think it's, it's never going to be as mainstream as D&D, but it's also always going to be around because, yeah. Like I said, you could update the themes a little bit to bring in whatever the hated enemy of the week is for our world society. But the game writes itself. I mean, <laughs> I mean, really, it is. Honestly, you could put whatever bad, you could put whatever label you want on it and just like change it up a bit and it would be fine. So, yeah, as long as we live in a bureaucratic capitalist society, paranoia will continue to be a game. A hundred percent. So, and that's what I love about this. It's, it's so. It's so it's it's mm, it's it's real enough that you can kind of see it a little bit, but it's also like <laughs> out there enough. You're just like, oh, sweet Jesus! Like, there's no way this would happen. There's no, there's no way they're gonna give me a, a health bar that might be made out of people, and we just don't know it. So it's just like, oh, this is great for me. How did you enjoy your nutrient bar, David? Oh, this is quite nice. Hmm, why is there a toenail on this? Don't ask questions, friend David. <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah i i truly enjoy this game so um so let me ask you james how many how many uh uh how many clones out of 10 would you give this one i mean i would give this a complete six out of six that's right because that's six is the, <laughs> that perfect, is the perfect number num- that's the that, perfect number of clones that's the perfect number of clones like i said it, as playing it in the spirit it's made it's a great game it's a lot of fun 100 percent. i would uh also give this a probably a six out of six because like i said this is i take it back i will give it a 5.6 out of 6 because like I said although it's amazing the, the the themes and everything are great you can't play it for long long settings that's the only drawback I have for it which to be fair I don't want to play it in a long setting this is made exactly the way it needs to be so but yeah um, guys if you guys have not played this uh, game again it is called Paranoia go out and check it out um, there are tons of little uh, RPG repositories online that you can go find and get the rule sets of it Watch Critical Role's uh, gameplay, but see if you like it. It's they have one shot. It, it's it is the slapstick version of the game. Yeah. It's a lot of fun though. They're in us- as usual in character, dressed up for it. It's great. One hundred percent. Which I, I wish sometimes I had that kind of money. I could just do that kind of yeah. dumb stuff. So and there's there's not really anyone else playing Paranoia. I mean, there's a few things floating around out there, but if you just want to watch something for an hour and see what the game's about, watch them. Yeah, and they do a really good job because they have that kind of dumb, kind of like a voice actor and actors kind of like vibe. Like they're creatives. That's what they do for their living. Yes. So they have a lot of fun with it. So, um, but yeah, so check it out, guys. Um, if you guys have any more questions about it, just hit us up. Let us know. James, I want to thank you for uh, delving. This is the first RPG we've dealt in a lot, dealt, dug into a little it a while. while. It's been a little while. Like I said, I've been trying to get uh, Zach over here maybe for some D and D. Figure out maybe we could do like an early D and D edition, just kind of yeah, the first or second edition. Yeah, it's something that's a little less dense. We could talk about Thaco, and we could talk about uh, Vecna, the, com- the comeliness score that women had for a while in D and D. 
<laughs> like I said, there's a good there's a good reason they had updated editions and that went away. I'm just saying. Uh, the incredible controversy when the Rogue Class got released. I mean, oh my god! Uh, yeah, there's some interesting D and D history we can talk about. Uh, tons of stuff. And that might be a big, uh, more like a two parter. Maybe we might mm-hmm. split that one up. So, but yeah, that's. Uh, I really enjoy these kind of things, and it's a nice departure from just straight up anime and uh, video games every once in a while. So, mm-hmm. but yeah. Um, guys, if you have any uh, any uh, you know topics you want us to talk about, write us in. You know, message us over uh, social media, whatever you want. I know James and I are, are we love talking about whatever the heck we want to talk about, but we want to hear every once in a while what you guys want us to talk about. If you don't agree with what we talked about today and you think Paranoia is a dumb game, we'd love to hear about that too. We will firmly disagree with you. Friend computer would remind you that happiness is mandatory. That's right. <laughs> so you must love. The, the 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 friend computer uh, RPG, which is paranoia. So, um, <laughs> so God, I love this so much. But yeah, check it out, guys. If not, uh, yeah, that's your own uh, own sadness and single tear rolls on my face. Um, but either way, <laughs> guys, uh, James, I want to say thanks for coming in and sharing us your enormous wisdom, which is you know RPGs. I would say this is probably one of the things you have a lot of knowledge in that I that I sorely lack in, but I am getting there. Because I had a dead period of my life where I didn't have a lot of people to play RPGs yeah, with. It but it's okay, you're back in my life again, James. It's okay. You just you can hold me. You wrap me in your warm RPG blanket. Oh, sweet kisses and nothing. <laughs> All right, guys. We're going to go ahead and get out of here. I appreciate you coming in and listening to us talk dumb and uh, talk paranoid today. Uh, we will see you again next month again for next month's news. All right, James. Talk to you later, man. If you're interested in keeping up to date with new episodes on our channel, Add us on any of your favorite podcasting apps or subscribe to our YouTube channel at Seriously Pointless Conversations. If you have questions or concerns, please email us at seriouslypointlessconvo at gmail.com. We appreciate any feedback. Thank you for listening to our show.